Well, welcome back. I guess I could emulate Floyd and whistle something, but I was thinking about it as I came in this morning. The only thing I can think of to whistle would be shaving a haircut six bits, and that doesn't really work for what we're going to do today. So rather than whistle, let's start with a prayer. Father, we thank you for all of the things that you do for us, all the blessings that you give us, our church, our families, all of our friends we know are directly attributable to your love. And we thank you for it and we worship you for it. And we ask that you would be with us today as we come here to study your word, that you would guide us in the direction that you want us to go, that you would give us the wisdom to understand the meaning of your word and that you would give us the enthusiasm that we need to live it. We lift up to you in prayer today, Father, Nancy Brocious, who lost her son this week. We know that she's hurting, but we also know that she's comforted in the fact that John is now with you. And we ask that you be with she and Don as they grieve for their son, John, that you would give them the comfort and the peace that comes with the full understanding that John is now with you. And we once again lift up to you Patsy Schlichting, who's going through the rehab process for her knee surgery. We understand that it's going to be a painful process and we ask that you give her the strength to endure, to do the exercises, to get well, and to emerge from this repair process a fully restored person, physically. And we also lift up to you all of the others in our Grace Church family who may be suffering now from illness or other problems that you be with them on a daily basis as we know you are and that you provide them the comfort that comes with knowing you just as we ask you to be with our leaders wherever they may be as they make these daily decisions that must be made in order to live with this virus that has infest infested the world that you would give them the wisdom that they need to make the decisions that are right for us, for our neighbors, and for everyone. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, last week I asked you to give me some feedback on what you wanted to do in this uh, series of Bible studies that we're doing on videotape whether we continued with living with the coronavirus or went back to a more formal study of the Bible. And the responses were pretty split. Some said, let's go back. Others said that whatever I wanted to do was fine with them. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, I don't want to talk about the coronavirus anymore, except maybe occasionally. So today, if you hear me say COVID-19 or coronavirus again in the rest of this discussion, then you'll know that my memory failed me because I'm 83 years old and I really don't want to talk about it again. So I thought what we'd do is we'd go back to the Gospel of Matthew, back to where we were on February the 19th when we were in Matthew 14 and talking about the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 people on a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And in that study, at the conclusion of it, we concluded that if we are to live as Jesus wants us to live, then we must bring our lives to God in a spirit of obedience and sacrifice, no matter how small we might think our gifts or talents may be. And this is a directly 
addressed in Romans 12, verse 1, when Paul tells us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then we know when we do this that God will always exceed our expectations of him. Again, from the New Testament, Ephesians 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that kind of wrapped up that Bible study that we had on February the 19th, which wasn't the last time that we met here, but it was the next to the last, because in the next lesson we talked about Christian responsibilities for voting. And since we don't have an election anytime soon, we will postpone the next one of those until we need to talk about it. And so today we're going to move on to chapter 15 in the Gospel of Matthew. But let me give you some background context before we read that scripture. This section of the Gospel of Matthew is almost entirely made up of Jesus' teachings and his teachings in response to the challenges from the religious leadership of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers, the scribes. So today, as we read this scripture, what we want to try to do is get behind the scenes, so to speak, to learn more about this culture among the religious leadership, which eventually leads to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And when you read today's scripture, I think you'll find that it's obvious that the controversy between Jesus and those leaders at the temple is becoming sharper and sharper with each conflict that arises between them. So let's go to the Bible. Chapter 15 of Matthew, verses 1 through 20. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth that's what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain this parable to us. Are you still so dull, Jesus asked them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? 
but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. There's a lot to talk about when we think about this scripture. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law mentioned in verse 1 come from Jerusalem some way away, and, and they're kind of considered the high muckety-mucks among the people. But Matthew, as he wrote this, probably thought of them as meddlers, and he knew that they were the source of Jesus' most vocal opposition. And this attack on the elders or the, on the disciples comes from what the Bible calls the tradition of the elders, which refers to a body of oral teachings and rules that commented on the law as these leaders found it in the Torah. Rules of conduct that have grown up over the years. And if we go to Mark, we find that he gives us a little bit more information on this particular issue. This is found in Mark 7, verse 3 and 4. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And evidently, based on what the leaders say, the disciples had failed to follow this little unwritten rule, if you will. So Jesus evidently thinks about it, but he doesn't respond to this very direct criticism. Instead, he attacks these people in another way. And what he does is he makes a fundamental distinction between the authority of the command of God as found in the scriptures and Jewish tradition as has been described by their religious leaders over the years. And this rebuke that he gives his critics is based on the fifth commandment and the punishment prescribed for those who fail to follow God's commands. We find this in two places, Exodus 20 verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you and Exodus 21, verse 17, which says, anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. And so Jesus, as he honors God in his commandments, expects everyone to take care of their parents in accordance with God's law. And he faults his critics for allowing some children's greed to abrogate that responsibility by declaring korban, K-O-R-B-A-N or C-O-R-B-A-N. And that's defined in Mark 7 verses 11 through 13. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything but for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, 
And you do many things like that. So what we find is that Jesus is criticizing the leadership because the rules that they establish for living do not honor God's word. They've developed a system where a son, usually a, always a son, can say to the church, I can't take care of my parents because I have to give this money to the temple, which is good for the leadership, but not good for the parents. And the dirty little secret here is that this same vocal tradition, these little rules for living that have been promulgated by the religious leaders, allow several ways for them to back out of that promise so that the money doesn't really go to the parents. Maybe not all of it's going to go to the temple. And because of this, Jesus goes on to call these leaders hypocrites. And if you check the Bible, this is the first recorded instance of him using that word. And what he's really saying in today's vernacular is you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. His criticism is that while they make a show of devotion to God, their religious traditions that are man-made take precedence over God's will. Live the way we tell you to live, not the way God tells you to live. And Jesus sees their hypocrisy as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy even though Isaiah was talking to the men of his day some several hundred years prior to the arrival of Jesus Christ. But there are three points that he makes here, really. Both Jesus and Isaiah are talking to the Jews. They're giving them a warning. And all of the Jews that they were talking to were from Jerusalem, where the big temple is located. The Sadducees are there. And both Isaiah and Jesus are really telling these Jewish men from Jerusalem that their religious fervor is all bells and whistles with no substance they change the meaning of God's Word. And what they had done is that they had displaced the true religion of the heart with the religion of form. Think about that. And when Jesus says heart here, he's not talking about the organ in your chest that pumps the blood through your body. He's talking about the essence of all of us. Our soul, our spirit, the way we think, the way we live, the heart of the person. And as a result, what both Isaiah and Jesus are saying in effect is that the result of their worship process, the ritual, and the rules that they give for people to live by are really vainglorious. And what they're really doing is they're teaching their thoughts and their rules rather than God's word. And what they tell their people has no God's authority behind it. And you know, if you go back and look at those first 14 chapters of Matthew, Jesus, for the most part, had kept his criticisms of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers and the scribes private. He really hadn't made any public 
display of criticism, except to his disciples privately. But now, given this attack, he turns to the crowd and says, pay attention, I'm going to tell you about this. And when he does this, he answers very directly the question that the leaders had asked him back there in verse 2, when they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus tells them why. What they eat does not defile the body, but what they speak defiles them. And when he says this, the disciples are afraid that the Pharisees are going to be offended because they heard what he says. But Jesus dismisses them their concerns. He says, leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And old Peter steps up and says, you know, tell us what you mean when you give us this parable. And that really exasperates Jesus. He says, are you still so dull? Meaning, haven't you been paying attention to me for the last three years? But then he goes on to answer Peter's question and he says, Essentially, what goes into the mouth follows a natural process and is eventually expelled from the body, and the body profits from it. But what comes from the mouth comes from the heart, this essence of all of us. It doesn't come from the stomach. And when it comes from the heart and comes out of the mouth, it can convey evil in thoughts and action. And when that happens, the person who speaks is defiled by his words and his actions. And that's pretty much the end of that story. And then the question becomes, what is it that we take away, that we learn from this scripture? And I think there are at least two important lessons to be learned. And the first and foremost of those two lessons is that we really need to work hard not to be like the Pharisees and the teachers in that we concentrate on form instead of substance. And there are many examples of that. I'll just give you two or three. And we start off by the fact that as believers, we acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and we worship him by living a righteous life. And when we come together as a church to worship, the ritual that we have, the sequence of events that we follow, the songs that we sing, all of that is a guide to help us in this process of worshiping together. And our response to that ritual should reflect that belief that we have that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and should not reflect our desires for a song or a prayer that we like. In other words, if we come to church and say, well, you know, if they sing that song again, I'm going to quit because I don't like it. Or if the preacher doesn't pray a certain way, I'm going to quit because I think he ought to pray another way. And when we're at church and we see someone over there who's lifting his or her arms and prays, and we think, you know, I don't like that person doing that. It embarrasses me. And I think I'll come back when 
they don't come back or I'm going to quit because I don't want to be here when people are enthusiastic about their worship. And we certainly get away from what Jesus tells us to do if we go to that person and say, I wish you wouldn't do that. And to kind of sum up this particular topic, we should never object to change just because that's not the way we used to do it. And number two, appearances can be deceiving and in this regard we can even fool ourselves. Just because we go to church and pray and tithe does not mean that we are righteous. And we can't rely on our tradition to pray at church, to give money to the church. We can't rely on that to change our lives. The way we change our lives is by relying on the Word of God and the way we rely on the Word of God is that we read it and try to understand it. It is our roadmap. God is our guide on our journey. And when we think about this, we're reminded of Jesus' charge to his disciples that we find in John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So this takeaway is, it kind of boils down to this. When we ignore the Bible in our day-to-day -day life, and when we limit the times that we pray to the times that we are in church, we're going to get lost on our journey. And our hearts will not reflect our faith. They just reflect the tradition that we've established. And when this happens, God will know it happens, even if we don't understand it. And one last point that goes back to what Jesus deemed to be the first and the second most important commandments. To love your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And when we allow ourselves to gossip about people that we are criticizing to post things on Facebook that denigrate whatever when we allow our mouths or in this case our fingers as we type on the keyboards to sully other people, then we are surely not living a life of righteousness. God bless you and keep you and have a great week.